So I was asked to give a presentation on some of my archiving projects. I cover a number of them in my chapter in the book, but I'm going to cover two of them today. So I'm a bit of a data hoarder. I know we're all calculator hoarders, but I'm also a data hoarder. And I've worked on a bunch of virtual collections of HP calculator related materials over the last 25 years. My biggest one is my hpcalc.org website, the Hewlett Packard Calculator Archive or HP Calculator Archive. And it's a collection of software and documentation for the graphing models, originally the 48 and then I extended it to the 49 and subsequent models. The, this presentation, as I said, will cover two things, the, the HP Calculator Literature Archive and the HHC USB drive. I based this presentation loosely on the two presentations I gave at the HHC conference this year, but this has some new material. So first, the HP Calculator Literature Archive. This is online. It's a website at literature.hpcalc.org. And it's intended to have two purposes. One is to be a list of uh, HP calculator documentation, and the other is a source for it. And doc by documentation, I mean manuals from the calculators and the accessories, as well as third-party books related to HP calculators. So Jake has his collection of periodicals, brochures, that kind of thing. I do the manuals. So there really is not much overlap at all between our two different collections. The idea for making this website started in 2008 when I had some conversations with HP, where they had had some ideas of how to make my website more beneficial to them and everyone. And this was one of the ideas, but not, not everything came out right away. And finally, uh, a few years ago, I started working on this. I, uh, the reason for doing this was because, for a couple of reasons. First of all, HP, over the years, has had many of their calculator manuals for download on their website. But as you may have noticed, their website is always changing. Addresses move around, files disappear, so it's not really a reliable source. And also, a lot of the older models did not have manuals online ever, so I wanted to provide those also. At the HPCC 2020 virtual conference, I launched the initial version of this site, which was mostly just my collection of HP's manuals plus a few others. And over the last two years, it has grown substantially. I'm very close to having it where I want it to be, but in theory, it could get a whole lot larger, but I'm reaching the end of what I really need on it, I think. So as I said, first thing it has is it's a bibliography of all known to me HP calculator literature. So it has over 2,400 items in it, and you can sort it and search it within your web browser. It's a single file, so you can save it offline too. It's on the USB drive. And has the metadata about each, uh, each document, like ISBN or part number, publication date, language, and what calculators are associated with, uh, different other categories I've put them into, author, that kind of thing. And as I said, the second thing is this is a repository of the documentation to download it. So I have, as I said, the original official PDFs of all manuals released by HP at some point or another. Nearly all of these were on their website at some point or another. And I downloaded them over the years or found them on archive.org uh, way back machine. Some of, the, some of them had never made it online, I believe. And I was able to get those from Cyril. It also has some original PDF format books that third parties had produced. Some of these were already on my hpcalc.org website. Some were on hp41.org. But I'm not keeping all PDFs ever made, but just uh, important book, books, basically. And then finally, it has scans of printed books made either by me or others in the calculator community. So this includes all the other manuals for the HP calculators that predate HP releasing PDFs, as well as third-party books written over the decades. Here are a few examples. You can see here the HP manuals, some third-party books, and then towards the, on the right side, some of HP's original PDFs. So like there's the PPC ROM manual, fairly large one to scan. So my scanning project, my goal is to scan everything myself. And the reason for that is many of Many books have been scanned at some point or another. 
Oftentimes that may have been 20 years ago with a black and white, low resolution, uh, limits by the technology of the day and how much time people were, were willing to put into it. I want to make definitive scans that nobody else ever has to scan these again. Uh, with the equipment I have, I have some decent quality stuff. I have a, a Fujitsu FI7160 scanner. That's an automatic document feeder. So I can put in a stack of a couple hundred pages. It scans both sides at the same time, feeds them through automatically. I have an Epson V850 Pro flatbed scanner. That is a recent upgrade. I had previously been using a, a cheap Canon that wore out, so now I finally got the scanner I really wanted. And then finally, for books where I need to destroy them to scan them, to run through the ADF, I have a, a guillotine-style stack paper cutter from Martin Yale. Put the, put, the, put the book in there, turn the crank to tighten it, pull the lever down, it just slices the whole end off the book. Where did I get the books? Well, close to 600 hundred of them came from Richard Nelson, since he has decided to eliminate his HP calculator collection. Uh, he coordinated with me before selling them off so that I would have the opportunity to scan every item before it disappeared. I got close to 600 books scanned already from him. Then Bob Prosperi has lent me about 50 more. Sorry, he can't be here, but he has a few dozen more I think he'll be sending me in the coming months. I have about 60 books from my personal collection, uh, which is slowly growing as I've been finding things on Amazon and eBay and stuff like that to scan. And then many others have either donated or lent me a book or two just to add to the collection as well. Before you go on, yes. I've got a quick question. That sure. Your, your little team means that if you want the perfect scan of the book, you basically got to destroy the book. Yes. Unfortunately, thankfully, that's only a small subset of the books because usually I do not need to destroy books, but yes, if they are perfect bound, perfect bound meaning either hardcover or soft cover, I have to cut the binding off. Once I've done that, I can put a new binding on it. And the easiest and in some ways most useful is to put a spiral coil binding on it. Then the book will lie flat, go 180 degrees, go well, 360 degrees if you want. It'd be much more readable, but it also takes away some of the collector value for the book. The other is to attempt to rebind it as a perfect binding, and I've played around with that a little bit with the glue, clamping it down, and had surprisingly good results sometimes. It's not going to be as good as the original binding, but it can turn out okay. Yeah, for, yeah, for holding the binding to the book or the binding to the cover. Some, sometimes the soft cover ones, some of them are just glued, some of them are glued and sewn. If they're glued and sewn, then it becomes much more difficult, but if it's just glued, I can pretty much just replicate that by gluing the binding back on. Talked about making an inspiral about uh, something I've, I've noticed that if, unless you intend for a to be spiral bound, then binding in that way after cutting off the end, you have that particular binding means that you often end up putting holes through important bits of the text. That's possible. Uh, thankfully, I've not run into that, except in very rare cases. I usually try to cut as little off as possible so that there's still some room, and, I, and I, I can adjust how far in the holes are too, and I try to make it not too far in. So usually I'm not cutting off anything of importance. Sometimes some lines get cut off, but as far as actual text, it's been rare. So as I was saying, my scanning process first is I unbind it, if that's possible. And that just means if I have a spiral, comb, wire, stapled binding, it's pretty easy to take the binding off, scan it, put it back together again when I'm done. But if it's a perfect bound book, then as I said, it's a destructive process. Uh, if it's a book that would have to be destroyed and I would not want to destroy it either because the person who lent it to me said don't or I just don't want to, then I will manually scan it with a flatbed. That has some potential issues as well with a perfect bound book if it's too thick It'll crease the binding if you push it down hard enough to not have distortion in the scans. Uh, if it's a hardcover book, you're less likely to notice because the binding part is separate from the spine of the book. I scan everything at 600 dpi, and I use 24-bit color if there's any color on the page, otherwise 8-bit grayscale. For all my steps in the process, I use only lossless compression, so there's no JPEG ever which causes artifacts that hurt the quality. 
but it also means I have uh, probably terabytes of TIFF files from the original images that I've scanned. Uh, then ultimately I end up with, uh, with ping images that are 400 DPI, downsampled to 400 DPI in either 8-bit color or 4-bit grayscale to produce the PDFs. I could produce full 600 DPI 24-bit color. They're about four times the file size and marginal extra quality, in part because ADF scanning is not quite as good as flatbed. So although I scan at 600, it's maybe about 400 DPI, 500 DPI equivalent from a flatbed. So it doesn't really lose too much. Then I also add a clickable bookmark list for a table of con from the table of contents. I go into great detail about this in my HHC 2021 presentation, if you want to watch that. Just of it is, the steps are, I take this, the raw scanned image, I run automatic cropping, which crops the black edges off it. Then, if necessary, I manually de-skew. There is some automatic de-skewing done, but I try to get it within about a tenth of a degree. Two tenths of a degree is noticeable, so I try to get it down to about a tenth of a degree. Then I, do, again, do batch processing that cuts the edges to make it so that there's no black border at all and makes every page the same size so you don't have like each one page two, millim two millimeters different from another page or something like that. Then I do a batch process that adjusts the levels. You can see the black has got a little bit darker here. If I have color on the page, I process the color and black and white parts separately because oftentimes the color needs a little bit less processing than the black and white. Then finally, I manually look at each and every page and clean up any, any imperfections on the page, maybe stray ink or dust or, or write it, handwriting or whatever. Then I optimize the ping to make it as small as possible, convert it to PDF. Ultimately, in the end, we have PDF here. I'm showing two pages side by side. It's very handy for reading the books. Most PDF, in fact, I think all PDF reader software lets you show the pages side by side. So you can see the left and right side. Then here's the clickable table of contents. So you can see uh, every, this is everything I've taken from the OCR table of contents and then hyperlink to the appropriate pages. What I have now on the website, 1,467 books that, have, that, that are available for download. This includes 518 books, that's a little over 80,000 pages of PDFs that came from HP originally, plus another 24 books with six and a half thousand pages, six and three hundred thousand pages of scans that HP had made. So HP did scan a small number of books that they had on their website. They were usually not the best quality, but I'm including them just to have their complete collection of official PDFs. Then I have personally scanned almost 85,000 pages, over 700 books over the last two years. Then other people in the community have produced uh, 62 books, actually a few of those were from me, that were original PDFs, almost 10,000 pages. Finally, another 162 books, over 20,000 pages of scans done by others in the community that I did clean up before making the PDF. So I took their scans, went through my processing. I'm slowly been redu I've slowly been reducing this last number as this number goes up, because, uh, or this number goes up, because I've been rescanning books that others have done at higher quality. So in total, over 200,000 pages, about 35 gigabytes. At least one book a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to, uh, not doing anything else. We're not sleeping. I, while I'm eating, I'm working on processing images. While I'm on the bus going to work, I'm processing images. Uh, yeah, I've, I've spent all my free time on it, and that's why I'm glad I'm basically done, because I need to do something else. It should be a medal of vindication. Are you, are you sharing this? It's, yep, it's all on the website. It is on the USB drive as well. So this shows you how the site has grown over time. So August 2020, which is when I started just with what came from HP, that was around, I don't know, 70,000 pages or, or so, and uh, maybe 400 items. Then it grew a little bit. Here, this giant jump is when Cyril sent me a whole bunch of HP documents. Then this has been continuously going up. Occasionally you see it plateau a bit when I decided to just take a little bit of a break. But sometimes 
I don't entirely take a break like I go on vacation and bring my scanner with me. <laughs> I did not bring it on the airplane. I don't have it here. You said you've been scanning Richard Yes. I've scanned his entire collection. Yes. Does it actually say that it's from his collection? It doesn't. It doesn't, but basically close to 90% or 80% or so is from him. <laughs> Yes. I see that items recently have been going up faster than pages. Does that mean that you're getting more thin and thick books? So in some ways, yes. Like I, I, there occasionally are some long books, but in some ways, I think I have been doing some thinner books. Getting rarer items, or just thin items. That could be too. Yeah, I, I did a lot of the HP man manuals earlier on, and those tend to be thicker than the third-party books that I've been going through now. Mm-hmm. Then this is showing specifically ones that I've been scanning. So the other one included everything. This is just what I've scanned, which was zero at the start of the project and has gone up now, as you can see, about 85,000 pages. This here, it's more pronounced when I'm working really hard on something like uh, taking, uh, taking all my weekends doing it or other times when I'm away from home and just flattens out if I'm just like right here, I, I decided to take time off and just not scan for a month. So the current status of this project, there are uh, 556 known English language HP materials. And I, I've scanned almost all the calculator owner's manuals. I'm, I'm, I'm only missing two. I've scanned almost all the quick references, again, only missing two. Uh, missing a 16 or so of the accessory or modules. Uh, I've got most of the application books, but I'm still missing probably about 27 or so. Users library books, again, I have most of them just missing about 13. Service manuals, there, I have most of them scanned, but a lot were photocopies, and if I could get original copies, those would make better scans, but I've been working with what I had, and a lot of what Richard had were only photocopies, which still can usually turn out well. There are some, some are better photocopies than others. Then the NOMAS stuff, I'm missing most of that. I know other people have scanned a lot of it, so it's not that much of a concern, but it would be nice to rescan some of those. But then for non-English language materials, that's where I'm missing a lot more. In part because I don't even know what I'm missing. A lot of the source materials I'm looking at are parts catalogs and stuff that have English language only, so I don't necessarily know what other languages HP produced the manuals in. And I've tried to find it out as best I can, and as I said, I found 387 of them, but I only have 23 scanned. This is not a priority for me. My main goal is preserving the information, and usually these were originally written in English, meaning English is the original source, and that anything else is just a translation. So for completeness, it would be nice to have the other languages, but it's, I've not been hunting them down. When people, if people have sent them to me, I've added them, but that's it. Then finally, the third-party materials, I've only scanned maybe one-third of them. On the other hand, that's like 237, but on the other hand, 100 have been scanned by other people that I could just rely on their scans. I have not, a lot of those I know exist but have not put on this site because I don't want to put the time into cleaning them up if I can scan them myself first. And then there are another 59 of those are, are original PDFs that uh, I don't need to do anything to because I was just, just able to take them as is. So if you want to help, how can you help? Well, one is to lend me books to scan. I guess this audience is harder because shipping over the pond to me is quite expensive. But this more is just a, a plea to the general public, anyone who might be in the US listening to this recording. If you can lend me books, I will scan them. If you don't want me to destroy perfect bindings, that's a lower priority for me. I'm trying to get as much done as possible initially. Uh, otherwise, if you don't lend, if you can scan yourself 600 DPI with uh, minimal compression, uh, minimal processing, so I can do that manually, because yes, there's automatic processing, but it's not going to do as good a job as manually going through. Put them on Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, whatever, then I can download those scans, process them, and make the PDFs. And I have a, a separate page on this website, literature.hpcalc.org slash all, and that's the one that has the entire bibliography, but you can sort that by the format and say missing. Just look at the missing books, and anything that's missing means I don't know anyone who scanned it before. 
And some will say off-site in the download column. That means someone else has scanned it, and it might be on hp41.org or the hpmuseum.org, USB drive, hpmuseum.net, maybe some other site. They have scanned it, but still would be uh, beneficial for me to scan it as well. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to talk about was the conference drive, the H HC conference drive, but in some ways it's also an HPCC conference drive. This drive was, it's, it's originally we had a record of the annual American HHC conferences on this drive. And it's evolved to now just be a one-stop repository, almost, of all the world's HP calculator knowledge in one place. The history of the drive, it, in past conferences, a long time ago, there were sometimes floppy disks that were given out with the conference proceedings packets. Later years, CDs or DVDs. I know there were, there were several years I gave out a DVD of my website or CD of my website, that kind of thing. And over time, this became a USB drive. And also, as we've been going away from paper, the electronic copy of the proceedings on the USB drive has replaced the printed proceedings we had before. So now we just have a USB drive generally given out at, at the US conferences. The first drives were four gigabytes, at least the first ones I remember. And then by 2017, when I really started maintaining it myself, reached 32 gigabytes. 2019, we're up to 64. 2020, for the virtual HPCC conference, was the first time with a 128 gig drive. And now we are at a 256 gigabyte drive because I filled up the 128 gig drive last year. Thank you. What was that? I can see it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm hoping it's leveling off now because uh, the drives are getting more expensive than the prices are falling. These are not increasing. Not lately, yeah. Has been the most for a while. Yeah, pretty lately, yeah. I'm sure that will change at some point. But one good thing is that every drive is cumulative, meaning it contains all the previous drives. So if you have a 2022 drive, there's no reason to worry about 2021 or anything past. So this drive is to document the conferences because we, we have Jake's materials that have all the conferences on there and also all freely available material related to the calculators. And there's some stuff for HP computers and even like TI calculators as well. I know Gene Wright's been a big proponent of caring about all calculators. Our community is getting small enough. We can't just focus on HP anymore. We have to preserve the other brand's history as well. The structure of the drive has a bunch of different folders on it. The one for emulators, ROMs, this is all known ROM dumps of the calculators. Manuals, which is mostly my literature collection. Photographs, this has HPs of uh, professional photographs as well as some that people in the community have done. Fonts, various publications in multiple languages. Discussion forum archives with all the posts made to various forums over the years. The conference proceedings, Jake's PPC archive. Glenn Robb's hparchive.com, Warren Furlow's hp41.org, which is based on his torrent, uh, Collins and Johnston's H Australian HP Computer Museum, hpmuseum.net, series80.org, myhpcalc.org, and then some other archive websites, some calculator ads collected by Gene Wright, and then a whole lot more. Here is a graphical depiction of how full the drive is right now, about 183 gigabytes, or 183 gigabytes, so 197 gigabytes used, about 60 gigabytes free, and over 800,000 files. Here's a, a, pie, some pie, a pie chart with an inset of it showing how big the different categories are. Biggest is videos, 37 gigabytes, my literature archive, 35, hparchive.com, 23. Jake's PPC archive was 22 gigs on this version, although I hear his new one coming out next month. He said 26, I think. Yes. It's growing. Between 26 and 27. It keeps getting bigger. 10,000 new pages coming. Nice. That's a big increase from this last one. Scanned every day. Why? <laughs> Sounding like me. <laughs> and the other categories take less space. But the H HHC proceedings actually doubled in size this year. It's now uh, 11.2 gigabytes, and I think last year was about five. Well, the, that's all in here. 
Yeah, so the videos on here from 2018 to the present of all the conferences, including the virtual conferences. Here's a, here, a screenshot of what the front page of the, the drive looks like. So in-depth description of every, everything that's on the drive. As I said, the HHC conference materials. This has all the presentations and supplemental materials from 2013 to 2022. Most of them from 2006 to 2012. And then a few miscellaneous files from earlier years. I'm trying to collect the original files. I know Jake has scans of everything, but whenever possible, original PowerPoint, one note, whatever, not one, uh, whatever that Mac one is called, the original files on there. And then also the videos I'm taking of conferences. So 2018 through 2022 are on this drive, as well as the screen recordings from the HPCC virtual conferences in 2020 and 2021, the one full conference and two mini conferences. All these videos are online at videos.hpcalc.org, and I've made a web interface to watch all of them. Uh, separately, the, 20, uh, the 1986 through 2019 videos are available on another 256 gigabyte drive, completely full. And uh, most of the videos are also on videos.hpcalc.org, going back to 1986. And those, those are recorded by Jake from 86 through, all the ones from 86 through about 2010, and then since then we've both been recording videos most years. Then a few other miscellaneous videos. Gene Bright has some training videos and some other miscellaneous stuff. The, the, it was just mentioned, someone, I think earlier today, the HP Origins video, that's on there too. Here's a screenshot of the video player interface. So it has all the conferences on the left with all the talks. You can scroll down there and just watch here. And if you play, it'll automatically go to the next talk or you can just skip around or whatever. For conferences that both Jake and I recorded, there'll be a link to an alternate view and you click that and it'll jump to the other camera at approximately the same point within the presentation to see a different angle of things. Also, over 2,000 PDFs of HP calculator, of calculator inst instruction manuals. That's my literature archive, close to 1,500 manuals, plus several other collections. Katie Wasserman from was.net, which actually she just updated again recently, and the basic calculator manuals from basic.hop2.org. two angles, do you do a 3D reconstruction? <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> we can see how we've changed in size over the years. Right, yeah, <laughs> that too. Uh, as I said, Warren Furlow's hp41.org is on there. That, he he had a, uh, has a torrent from a couple of years ago, and then I've gone through and manually updated all the, all the, I've manually downloaded all the updates he made to the torrent since then. So it's not, it's not a browsable website, but just a folder structure of all the files from his website. On the, on the web, yes. How, how do you actually, um, you know, fund that? Because uh, I, I know myself, you know, on my servers, on my stuff, it's quite expensive sometimes, you know, to, to cost that. Uh, what do you mean? Storage, storage. Oh. On, on the web. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, my, uh, my costs have gone, well, a lot of this is hosted by other people, but think, some of these things I'm hosting myself, like HP Literature Archive, my main website, and yes, I'm, I'm spending around $500 a year in hosting costs to keep it all going. Yeah. So I have a complete offline mirror of my website. Uh, this was as of August 31st. I've not made changes to it since then. A couple bonuses that it has on here, the zip file contents are all also extracted, so you can browse those directly without having to unzip the zip files. And I have all historic versions of files, like if I've updated, if someone's submitted 10 updates to a program, they're all there, so you can see the old versions too. These are available online too. If you create an account and log in, then I, I provide access. I don't have access by default, just because that would make so many links and so many files that it would over, could overload my site more easily if a search, so when search engines are indexing or when people try to download the whole site. So a few things I have hidden, you have to log in first. And th those additions add nine and a half gigabytes to the two gigabyte base size of the site. Also, for, just for the fun of it, I have a historic version of my website from about 25 years ago. Jake's PPC archive, which he told you all about earlier. 
a couple screenshots here. Here's an example of who wrote this? <laughs> he was demonstrating that yesterday, but this, this shows you can click on the individual files in here to download them separately and chose the three versions that I've hosted and you can download the old versions too. Then on the right side, that's a screenshot of Jake's, Jake's collection over there. As I mentioned, the Australian HP, HP Computer Museum, all the file downloads from that site are on there. I don't have the website, but just the, the file downloads in a folder structure. That's over 7,000 files related to HP computers and stuff like that. A Hewlett Packard archive from, from Glenn Robb. It's a complete browsable mirror of that website, which also includes HP Journal and some other publications. Here's a screenshot of that website, which has the bench briefs that Chuck mentioned. The Vassalus Prevlicus is HP Series 80 website. It's a complete mirror, browsable mirror of that website as well with hundreds of files related to the Series 80 machines, manuals, programs, ROM images. Valentino Albio's HP collection, which is hosted on my server normally, and that's where he's, he's still actively updating this. He has almost 4,000 pages that he's produced, articles, programs, programming challenges, that kind of thing over the last few years. And that's also browsable online and on the USB drive. Screenshots of each. Again, there's a Series 80 website and Valentin's HP collection. Uh, also on the drive are the news group and discussion forums that I'd mentioned. So this has comp.sys.hp48, which was the main source for HP calculator discussion online throughout the 90s and into the 2000s. We are missing about a year of messages. I've given up on finding anyone who might have 93 to 94 still archived, but I've got everything else from July of 91 on there, about almost 230,000 messages. Compact system handhelds, got that from May 89 through June 2013. I stopped saving it then because there's nothing being posted there anymore. And actually even CompSys HP48, every, every month there's been something posted, but it's getting into the single digit number of posts each month now pretty much. Then the old email list from the North Dakota University system, about 2,000 messages from the 90s. Then the old HP Museum forum posts are archived, that's about 174,000 messages. The new HP Museum forum posts are also archived but only through May 2018. There's a user on the, the forum whose name I've forgotten and he had created a torrent uh, a torrent with all that, so I just downloaded that and parsed it into the messages and put it into a browsable interface. And at some point, we'll have to update it to add the next four and a half years of posts. But that was just 90,000 messages then. It's probably a similar number since then. Here's an example of the interface. This shows, uh, I think this is Compact HP 48 from June 2010. Just got a threaded view, and you click on each one and read the messages. So I've I parsed out everything, all the headers, so that it's so it's shown in this common interface for all the different forums. Other archived websites on, that are on here, hhc.us, that's a website started by Joe Horn to archive the conference websites for the HHC conferences. It's now maintained by David Ramsey, but that's got everything from 2000 to the present. And then the other websites here are no longer online. I have saved them either by saving them when they were still online myself, pulled them from the Wayback Machine, been able to get files from other people who may have saved them. hp42s.com from Eric Erling. JacquesLaporte.org. This is a really, really in-depth, detailed explanation of the algorithms behind some of the classic machines like the HP35. Uh, Greendike.nl, Green that's a, a website where this Dutch guy had recreated some of the manuals for various machines like the 15C and 41C completely from scratch in a web browsable interface, but it's no longer online. And even has an online HP65 emulator with application cards, so I brought that online on the USB drive and on my archived.hpcalc.org website where I keep uh, preserved old websites. Finally, super site. This one uh, there are variations of this website floating online. I've tried to combine them to have what is hopefully a, as comprehensive as possible collection of software for the 100LX, 200LX, 95LX. It's around 1,000 programs. Some screenshots. This is the Green Dyke 
a manual from the 15C, and then a sample page from Jacques Laporte's website. A folder with fonts, over 60 of them, mostly by HP, but Ted Kerber, who, who passed away a few years ago, but he was a regular attendee of HP, HHC conferences. Luis Vieira, he's, a, he's maybe Portuguese or Brazilian or something. He created some of the, some of the fonts as well. HP learning modules, those were published by HP for about 20 calculators from the 2000s. I think Gene Wright had helped out on those. And then also Gene, what was that? Yeah, yeah. Very OK. Very yeah. Then uh, 1,500 images of newspaper ads for old calculators that Gene had collected and he presented at HHC a few years back. There's a periodical section with various newsletters, HP Solve, which Richard Nelson had edited, a couple French publications, uh, palm top paper about the handhelds, about the 100, 100 LX, I think it was, and then a couple TI newsletters as well. Screenshots of a sample ad and a cover page from one of the French publications. <laughs> There's a folder with ROMs. This has hundreds of ROM dumps from various HP calculators, every one I've been able to get my hands on. It even includes a number of never publicly released beta ROMs from some of the graphing models, like the 49G and stuff like that. There's a folder of photographs, around 200 of HP's official press photographs, as well as scans of promotional slides, both from HP and third parties that I scanned. Uh, they're mostly 35 millimeter slides. Some were uh, transparencies, like four by five transparencies. Another about 100 photos that I took of HP calculators. I need to go back and finish photographing my collection, but about maybe 10 years ago, I took pictures of a bunch of them. About 40 other photos taken by other people in the community, including some interesting die shots and stuff like that. There's an emulators folder with Windows-based emulators and simulators. Uh, Christoph Gieselink's AMU 28, 42, 48, 71, all pre-configured with the ROM images and the skins so that you can use them right away. So this is, I just, this folder is specifically just Windows stuff, but the other, some of the other platforms are elsewhere. And yes, in the App Store and stuff like that. Uh, simulators like Free42, Plus42, New RPL, the WP31 and 34, also ready to run. Nonpareil by Eric Smith. And then all of, they're not ready to run, but installable simulators that were produced by HP. There's a folder of those. And then as mentioned before, Tony Nixon, he's done a lot of really low level uh, analysis of a number of the machines to reproduce them, both physical uh, circuit board reproductions and simulators and emulators he produced for Windows. So his website is mirrored on here as well, current through the 16th of October. And you can download those, you can extract all those emulators too. A couple samples is just a sample photograph of an HP press photo of the 34C and then in the 48 running a 50G. There's the HP Calculator Schematics folder. Uh, I wish Tony Duell were here, but he hand drew hundreds of, or well over 100 schematics. And they're a CD that you could originally acquire, now just download from hbcc.org. I've included that on the drive. Uh, on groups.io, there's a group for the HP 75. I have the hundred, hundreds of files that I've downloaded from that that are in here as well. And something new this year, CB Wilson, he was a TI engineer about 40 years ago. He'd worked on a number of products. And w after he passed away, he had left behind a whole lot of interesting stuff that has since been scanned. It's around four gigabytes of scanned internal TI materials. Here's a sample of the schematics that Tony Duell did. So much work must have gone into all those. Now, most of you have a USB drive already. For anyone who doesn't, I will have them for sale on my website, commerce.hpcalc.org, after I return from, the Europe, from, the, from Europe after the end of this month. Price will be $65 US plus shipping. For those of you here, I do still have a few more that will be available at a discount. And one thing I should note, because I tend to get comments about this from people, they say that they, oh, they 
put the drive in their computer and their virus scanner software says it's going to destroy everything or something. Most of them are false alarms. They're, there's really just one to be aware of. It's not a false alarm, but it's also not a concern. There's a file called already.com and it identifies a Trojan because it does some low level stuff with a computer. It's a DOS program for the, like the 100LX. It serves a specific purpose on there that's useful. It's not going to harm a modern computer. It won't even run on a modern computer, so don't worry about it. So yeah, anything the virus scanner says, just ignore. What I can do now is show a quick demo of just browsing through the drive if there's some time. This is the main, the main page of the drive. You put, put the drive in your computer. It has a HTML file in the, at the root. Uh, right here. Uh, browse H, HC USB drive. There's also one for open PPC archive. That opens Jake's, web, uh, Jake's collection, which you should only open in a PDF, a standalone PDF viewer because it, yeah, it won't really work. It won't really work in a web browser or anything like that. So we'll just focus on the on the main drives. This is the top of it. There's a link here. This is the conference materials. So we can go in here like 2022. I'll pick Mark. And you, can, you can see each of the presentations in here. Or any of the other years. Going back as far as 98, there isn't much from there. But some of the, some, most of these years have a fair number of materials. The videos, this is what I'd mentioned was the collection of videos from recent conferences. You can see Felix is here. And I'm going to scroll through here. You can see there's a mini conference from HPCC. We've got Wadik here. Welcome everybody. Um, well. And then a few miscellaneous videos here, business math training. And the HP Origins video that was mentioned earlier that is worth watching, 25 minutes long. When you put together the uh, videos and everything for this conference, um, you can just download them from your site? Put them from yes, so, yes, so all of them I upload to YouTube, and then you can download them from YouTube but using whatever YouTube downloader you prefer to use. Mm -hmm. I use one called YTDLP or something like that. And then you'll just have a, a video file that you can browse locally. But also, you can use that website, videos.hpcalc.org, and browse them that way. In fact, I have, I'm online here, so I can. Do you put everything up on YouTube? I do, yes. So here you can see I don't have any 2022 videos up yet, but they will be soon. And you can go back. These are the old ones from Jake, 2002, London. We just took you back in history. <laughs> They're all online, videos.hpcalc.org. And let's click on Here's the hp41.org. It has a quick splash page here, and then you can go to the separate folders to where he has all the stuff about the different modules, all sorts of different things. My website here, all the different categories for the graphing models. Jake's, which I won't go through here. My literature archive, this is most useful to talk about. One thing I should mention, I don't know why, but if you do the filtering up here, it's very slow on Chrome, but it's fast in Firefox. Like it may take a fraction of a second in Firefox, but a minute on Chrome. I don't know why. I'm sure it has something to do with my JavaScript code, but I haven't figured out what it is. If you want to find, let's say, if you've got on the HP 9100, okay. the, I don't have the computer stuff on here, so I don't have anyone here, but I just type HPAX, and you can see it's got some remakes of that, or you can clear it out and scroll through the whole list. If we want to just see, uh, want to just see ones written by a particular author, you can just go and say, pick this one here, you've got vintage games through the 41 or whatever. Or if we go back to here, there's this full master list. This is the bibliography I talked about. This 
shows every document I know about for HP calculators. Some I have, some I don't. On the right hand side, there's a column here. If it's in red, it says missing. That means I don't have it. Like the 15C Advanced Functions Handbook in German, I don't have. And nobody else has scanned it to my knowledge either. If we filter on English, which is the stuff that I'm most interested in, you can see I do have the vast majority of the stuff except down here. Third party materials, I'm missing some stuff completely. Page counts are shown here for each one. If we click on one of these, like we, let's just go down to say 12, for the 12C, the Real Estate Applications Handbook. You can click on it and see the manual and then go in here. You can drill down with the table of contents to go to a specific page. And these are all just scans for the most part. These are all the high quality scans. Yes, well, yes, some of them are not, but about, uh, as I said, about 700 of them are the high quality scans I've made. And then a, a large number are original PDFs from HP as well. This is the basic manuals collection. These are mostly like TI, Sharp, Casio, that kind of thing in various languages. It's all one page. Katie Wasserman's list of scan manuals for all sorts of different brands of calculators over the decades. Click on here's a Sears a Sears calculator. HPMuseum.net, as I said, these are just downloads. You click on one of these, like this folder here, it takes you to a folder and you click on the calculators and he gives you here's a calculator and handheld price guide from 1986. Lots of interesting material in that museum collection. HPArchive.com. This is a complete mirror of the website that you can just click on any link and it'll all work. The Baldin Albio's HP collection here. Uh, artwork is each season his, he has his daughter draws another artwork related to calculators. I'm not sure what calculator she's holding there. Maybe a 34 or something. I don't, I can't tell. And here are like some challenges he made and some scans of, or scans of documents that he's written or covers of books or whatever. Uh, photographs as well. Here's a, here's a Casio he took, photograph he took. And as I mentioned, series 80.org. There's a lot of stuff about the HP series 80, 83, 85, 87. If we go to here, we've got like manuals and stuff like that. The file downloads from groups.io, a lot of stuff for the HP 75 internal materials. My website as it looked like 25 years ago. These are the Green Dyke manuals that I thought were very nicely done. I click on the HP 97. You can click on a page, a section, go page by page through it, all just hand recreated. So these are not the original maps. What was that? These are not the no, these are complete recreations. I think he scanned them, OCR'd them, fixed, fixed mistakes in OCR, read it all the graphics and diagrams. A tremendous amount of work must have gone into that as well. So a few things are not HP calculator related. He's got like guitar and but it's the whole whole site's on here and they're mostly and you can see when I download it, it says this site stops days left 13 so he counted down the days until it went offline so I grabbed it before it disappeared this is the HHUC conferences through 2022 the individual conference websites hb42s.com shock report site the description of the cortic algorithm This is the super site with lots of programs for the palm tops. I won't go through all the newsletters, but these are the ones that I mentioned before. The, all the different emulators, fonts, photographs. Some of these are very good quality photographs from HP. Like there's the top of the 39GS. 
45, that kind of thing. Some other photographs that are on here. There's a some very close-up photos. This is from the 42S. A couple ones that Eric Smith did of the single. The there's a single board 15C. The single chip 12C. The schematics. This is from the HPCC.org website. All the hand-drawn ones from Tony Duell. These are learning modules. You pick a calculator, pick a learning module. Shows you how to do cost, price, margin, and markup calculations on the 30B. These are the news group discussion forums. So if we click the H, the old HP Museum forum, it shows you these are the years down the left, the months down the right. We just click August of 2005. These are all the posts that were made that month threaded. You click on one of them and it just shows you the raw text of the of the post. Usually they're pretty small. If they're image, embedded images, I save those as well. I think those are going to be most apparent on the newer forum. We'll see if I find any just randomly clicking. Maybe not. The 1500 ads here Click, click on random ones. Hewlett Packard announces HP 80 and HP 35 calculators are now available. Call HP at a seven digit phone number. He, he'd gotten a subscription to a newspaper service to get access to old newspapers and just save them all over the course of a month or so going through looking for ads. And then there's a CD for, about palm top computers. That's a quick overview of what's on the drive. Any questions? Yes. I've got twenty questions. Maybe I should sure. ask them over here. <laughs> one, one interesting matter: there are books that are out there being published, like Rebo Forty. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have them on the disc yet. Yes. But have you got an arrangement with people like myself that you get the code and at some stage either I drop dead? Mm -hmm. and then you know you can put it up. That actually is a very good idea. So the example that you gave of, uh, say, Recall 20 in this case, if we, I'm bringing up the full page again, RCL, Recall 20. So if we click on Recall 20, what it's going to do is it's going to show a cover of the picture and it says the file for the file instead of a download, it'll say book available for purchase from the original author and it links to chair at hpcc.org to email. What you should have, you should have on a backup disk somewhere the contents. So that yes. when we say we've run out of print copies, you can immediately I think that's a fantastic idea because that would save me from having to scan and produce an inferior file of the original. So yes, if any authors have produced books they don't want online yet, and I've got about a half dozen or so books listed on here that, you, that I know exist but you can't download. Uh, if I could at some point be able to put the original file, that would be very nice. Even for ones that I have scanned, if I can get the original files for, that's a superior format to the scan, probably. Okay, yes, that, that's, that's two different thing. things. One is getting the original format of things already on your disk, and the other thing is getting copies that you can put on the disk at some stage when something happens. We run out of the print run, mm -hmm. the author dies or something else. Yes, that, that's a good idea. I would, I would be very happy with doing that. I think Bruce, we should certainly send people twenty. Yeah, I've got a copy of it. So Frank or Paula sent a full copy PDF, through of the right. original and the word. Oh right. And the, the original sample artwork okay. that she did that wasn't, you know, the other artwork that wasn't used on the cover. I so think basically they have that. working the orange room. When Frank and I run out of the last print run we've got, then. Yeah. Um, Sounds like a good idea. Mark a copy of a Recall 40. I mean, it's not a backup, but um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we can send it to Eric and do the same the same thing. You know, the link to where to get them from. Yeah. Yeah. Like with Recall 40. Yes. I was just wondering, do you think we get a like better archivist 
conferences where you talk about best practices for doing this sort of thing, where I assume there's enthusiasts or just professionals who do this sort of thing? That, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that, but there might be. And in some ways, last year, my conference presentation was documenting how I am archiving these books in the hope that it might be useful to others. But as I gave the presentation, there were some comments from some people in the audience that were useful too. So yes, surely I could learn a lot from what other people have done too, but it's not something I've looked into. You mentioned fonts. So one of the things I noticed in putting the book together is some of the Louis Vieira's fonts no longer installed on a Macintosh because um, they're old TTF and they're missing tables and so on inside. Hmm. So they were good enough for Windows of the day, and possibly they still are, but the Mac now complains. So if anyone has, um, you know, font skills, so a copy of Fontographer or one of these fancy programs, and is able to convert them into open type compliant fonts, then that would be helpful, because sooner or later I suspect Windows will start complaining about them. Yeah. And that uh, people won't be able to you know, yeah. make use of it. Yeah, I can send you one that's, that's problematic and you can have a go at it. Or at least tell me what's wrong with it and then I can try and work out whether I can fix it using other tools. So, it's really that Well, there is that list, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are now Facebook calculator sites. Are you tracking those at all? No. So I pretty much stopped using Facebook in 2004, which is funny because that's the year it came out. But I've not been active on it since then, so I've completely not seen anything in the Facebook community. I'm hoping that nothing of consequence happens there, but I think it probably does. So if someone else has collected stuff from Facebook, I could I would appreciate any of that. I haven't heard anything from anyone. I generally watch very rarely against them. The Calc fan site, I think it's called, is roughly like Compass Age people today used to be, where most of the questions are questions that we asked 20 or 30 years ago, and that new users come up, and then somebody gives an answer. So most of it is pretty tedious. But as you say, occasionally a jewel will come up. Yeah, the. The, now most of the discussion that I see is just on the HP Museum forum, and it's quite active now. But it sounds like there is still discussion on other other platforms as well. You're not doing it if somebody is willing to do it. Interesting. Yeah, uh, things like that. I think it's valuable to create a backup of HPMuseum.org so we can have all that discussion preserved for ind indefinitely. Facebook, I get the impression there's no easy way to archive posts made from it. If someone knows how to, that would, it would be nice if we could save that, but I'm not, that's not something, not a task I'm going to be trying. I know that HP Denmark issued at least one, and I think it was two or three, uh, solution books in English, because they knew that they sell them abroad. I don't know whether you've got any films. That does not sound familiar, so I don't think I do. I don't know if Stain ever saw them, but they're probably in the TPC Denmark Library, which is vanished. I will look, because I think I might have one. It's in English, so it's interesting, but it was published in Denmark. Yeah, I did, I did get a scan of a user's, user's library solution book in Spanish, made by HP for the Spanish market for the, in Spain and that's the only not n not normally catalog listed solution manual that I've seen that wasn't English but that was English but not American I've not seen any of those which brings me to a huge cost resource uh, which is the user program libraries yes yes those are lost basically um, Solve and Integrate took them over in the United States and Eric Smith and I went to them and said if you're ever going to throw them away, contact us and we will hire a lorry to pick them up. And then a couple of years later we went to them and said, well, what's doing? Oh, we put them in landfill. He said, but we were going to take them from you. Oh, well, we didn't have the time to contact you, we should put them down. And a loss. Something similar has happened to you. Program 
and where when they closed it down in Switzerland, um, they said, would anyone be interested? There was a German version, there was a Spanish version, an Italian version, a German version, a Dutch version. I don't think there was a Danish version, there was an English version. HPCC said, yes, we'll take it. We'll take it. They said, oh, we'll only send you the English version, you won't be interested in the others. We'll send the others to user groups in other countries, but no one else picked them up. So if there's a program written only in Spanish, we haven't got it. We got the English version, we went through it, we picked out all the most interesting programs. A member of our club, John Hartland, said he will keep them at his home. If anybody wants a copy, he will send it to them. I got the dregs, I got all the rest. They're still in my attic. They're still waiting for someone to scan. But we finally got around wanting to scan them and we contacted John Hartman and he said, oh, I was still and my family threw it away while I was there. So he is the English language one that we have gone to a lot of trouble to save. The best stuff is gone. So at some stage, I need help from someone in HPCC to scan what's left that I've got, which I think is still going to be happen. But I don't know whether we should put out a call to user groups, user clubs, if you have got a user program library program at home, can you send a copy? I, I think that's important to do sooner rather than later because they're going to be rapidly disappearing, I think, considering they're 40 years old now. And one thing I have done as part of the literature archive I've, is I've scanned the latest known catalogs of them. I have the uh, solve and integrate US library catalog, the last one I found from I think 1987 or something like that. And I also have, uh, I don't know how new it is, but the one of the European library catalog as well. So I think if uh, the first step there might be to uh, first have a call to if anyone has them, look for them, but then also take those scans, take the OCR versions, put them into a web page where they can all be listed and we can mark which ones we have because we have several hundred already. The hp41.org has a good number. I know some others in the community have scanned some others. I think Valentin Albio scanned a whole bunch of them. And those are mostly in hp41.org. The hp41.org folder on the USB drive, I actually extended, added more files to the user's library solutions folder that I have acquired as well, that I've scanned some from Richard and that kind of thing. So that the USB drive might be the largest single source that I know of of those, but as I said, it's only a couple hundred and there are over 10,000 total, so it's a very small fraction. See, and some of them were also on the user's library solutions books. So we can, right, so we can go through and mark the ones in the books in the list too, so we can have a list saying this is what we have, this is what's remaining. If you have it, mark it down and say, hey, I can provide this to you somehow. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. We did get some of them used in Denmark. We had two big plastic bags of those. You still got it was in the library. Oh, so, again, the library was gone. Yeah. So it was Fleming here, he managed to get hold of them and said, oh, we can do things with it. And of course, we're busy with other things. And yeah, we just lost contact with Fleming. I am in contact with him. He has nothing. And what does he say? He hasn't got it anymore. No, no, he, he was part of the... And he left the club before I left. And he was the, the librarian in the club. I can no longer track that. He was the librarian 20, 30 years ago. But do you think they're thrown away or is there a chance of getting them? Uh, as you said, as Eric said, as soon as possible because yeah, I mean, some people are dying, their families might throw everything away after 10 years after they've died. So it's, I've got half an hour, of which 15 minutes have gone. So should I go up and use up my other 15 minutes? Okay. All right. Thank you.